Hello everyone, I'm Janine Kakmar with PHTV Channel 4 Palos Heights, back with our show all about books. <clears throat> On this show we'll talk about books and writing, authors and publishing, and we'll have a special guest with, guest with us to talk about what they're reading. But before we get to our visit, we're going to talk about some of the new releases coming up in April. And again, we won't have time to talk about all of the new releases, but we'll talk about the ones that are getting some special attention, and we'll cover some of the New York Times bestsellers. So we can get started with our feature titles. Our first title today is Anything is Possible by Pulitzer Prize winning author Elizabeth Strout. This author is known for her books Olive Kitteridge, The Burgess Boys, My Name is Lucy Barton, and they're all books that deal with turmoil in the family and tensions among the community. And in her new book, she explores a whole new range of emotions, human emotions through intimate dramas of people struggling to understand themselves. And as the author was writing her last book, she had two characters in there, Lucy and her mother. And these two characters told stories about other people. And it's these people that now inhabit her new book. In fact, Lucy comes back as an adult. She's a celebrated author, and she decides to go back to her hometown after being away for 17 years to visit with her family. Some other characters that make up an appearance as adults in her newer book is the Pretty Nicely Girls, and then the uh, Vietnam veteran who's dealing with uh, PTSD. But this author, Elizabeth Stroud has a very subtle writing style and she creates characters that really pull readers into their stories and into their dilemmas. And with her new book, she once again establishes why she's one of America's most respected authors. Our second feature title is The Shadowland by Elizabeth Kostova. This author was known for her first book that came out, The Historian, a few years ago, which is actually a very suspenseful uh, story about a young girl who was, went in search of the vampire-like human that inspired Bram Stoker's Dracula. Of course, this one was set in, that book was set in Eastern Europe, and her new book, The Shadowland, is also set in Eastern Europe. And it's a story about a young American woman who goes to Bulgaria to teach English after the sudden death of her brother. And the story begins she, right away. She's in a cab. In the back seat of this cab, she, when she gets into Bulgaria, she finds this urn of ashes. And so she spends the rest of the book riding through, driving along uh, communist Bulgaria, trying to find the family of the, of the person whose ashes she found. So the, the book is really a book that reveals the mystery of different cultures and language and it explores the power of family and the stories from the past. And our third title is Song of the Lion by Ann Hillerman. Now, Ann Hillerman is the daughter of the New York Times bestseller author Tony Hillerman, who was well known for his Navajo Tribal Police mystery series, which starred Lieutenant Joe Lee Porn and Sergeant Jim Chi. And now the daughter, she has picked up on the same theme. She writes about the Navajo Tribal Police, but she has her own characters starring Bernadette Manuelito, and she uses also Jim Chi and a retired uh, Joe Lee Porn. And in this, this book, her new one, is the third in the series, and it starts with a deadly bombing that takes Bernadette and Jim Chi back to the past to find a vengeful killer in this southwestern mystery. What seems like an act of eco-terrorism actually turns out to be something more complex and nefarious. And they find out that it actually might be related to a bombing that was um, a, to a case uh, years ago. I've read several of her books and many of Tony Hillerman's books, and I always look forward to their writing. They, have to, they write about the beauty of the Southwest country, the myths of the people, the customs, and, uh, and the rituals, and all of those are they come back in this new book, Song of the Lion. And our next feature title is The Stars Are Fire by Anita Shreve. Many of you know her as the New York Times bestselling author of The Pilot's Wife, amongst many other titles. And in her new book, she writes a suspenseful novel about a woman who's tested by a catastrophic event and its devastating aftermath. And it's actually based on the real life incident of the largest fire in Maine's history. 
The book takes place in October of 1947 after a summer of, a, a long summer of drought and fires begin to break out all along the coast of Maine from Bar Harbor to Kittery. Now at this time in history, Maine was 90% forests and they had no uh, trained firefighters. They had no way to deal with this type of event. The fire ended up consuming a quarter million acres in forests. It wiped out completely nine different towns and destroyed nearly half of Acadia National Park and all of the mansions on Bar Harbor, uh, the millionaire on Millionaire Road in Bar Harbor. So it was a very devastating event in real life. And in this story, it begins with a pregnant woman, Grace Holland, who has two small children, who's forced to protect her, her two children by her, on her own when her husband leaves to join the, fire, the volunteer firefighters. She's joined by her friend Rosie and her two small children, and they, are, they watch helplessly as the flames destroy their home, they burn, burns everything to the ground, and then eventually chases them out to the coastland and into the ocean, actually, and where they spend the night frantically trying to protect their children. And they wake in the morning to a landscape that is forever changed. They are homeless, they're penniless, and they have no idea about the fates of their husbands. So they face a very uncertain future in a, in a town that no longer exists. I know that sounds like a real cheery upper, but the book is very dramatic, and she, uh, has, very, she has a very strong fan base. And they all, the, the readers who had got early copies of this book said they could not put this book down. So you, you might want to put that one on your reading list. And our final feature title is Bear Town by the Swedish author Frederick Bachman. Now, just up until a few years ago, this author was unheard of in our country. He, until he published a small book called A Man Called Uva, which became a New York Times bestseller and became a huge hit amongst readers. All the book clubs were reading it, and it actually became a movie, which we're actually going to be showing at the library in May. And uh, the author has again come out with a dazzling, profound novel about a small town with a big dream and the price required to make it come true. Beartown explores the hopes that bring a community together and the secrets that tear it apart and the courage it takes for an individual to go against the grain. And this book received a five out of five stars on the Goodreads uh, site, the review site, and uh, readers will find that this author uh, once again works his magic with very unforgettable characters his, and his ability to create and out characters who are outliers, but they're still able to win our hearts. He did that in A Man Called Uva. Uva was the main character, very, very much a curmudgeon of a man, but he still managed to um, win our hearts over in that book. If you haven't read that one, you've got to read that one. You'll, you'll like that one. And I'm looking forward to Bear Town as well. So those are some of our featured titles coming out in April. And now we'll talk about the next two slides we'll have are the slides about the New York Times bestsellers. And again, these are titles that many of you know the, the authors. We have Steve Barry, who's back with a, a, a Cotton Malone novel titled The Lost Order. Lisa Scottling is out with One Perfect Lie. David Baldacci is out with his third Amos Decker book titled The Fix. And Mary Higgins Clark is, is out with her, her novel All By Myself Alone, about a glamorous cruise that turns deadly. And Sarah Paretsky is out with the new V.I. Warshawski novel, folks. I know many of you love this character, and it's titled Fallout, so that's coming out in April. And John Sanford, he has a new Lucas Davenport novel titled Golden Prey. And Iris Johansson has a new thriller titled No Easy Prey, and Stuart Woods is out with another Stone Barrington novel titled Fast and Loose. So those are some of the new books coming out in April. Some featured titles getting a lot of attention and some New York Times bestsellers. But we also have today uh, with us time, we have time to visit with our guests. So <laughs> today with us we have Gareth Blakesley. Gareth is the operations manager from Lake Catherine. And he's here today to talk about many things. There are many things going on at Lake Catherine. Mm -hmm. but 
but most specifically, we've got a brand new event coming up in April, right? Right. We have our first uh, uh, nature and literature festival, which we're really excited about. First ever in Palos Heights. Uh, I guess so. I believe so. Yeah. Yes. So we're very excited about that. Yeah. So the library and the Catherine are working together, mm -hmm. and we decided to plan this. How did, this was really your brainchild, though, dear. Uh, well, I'm not sure. That's a. Uh, <laughs> 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 I shouldn't take all, all the blame for it. Maybe I should. Um, no, we've been thinking about doing something like this for the last few years. And, uh, and uh, uh, I've always had an interest in literature. I've always had an interest in nature, as everyone knows, because I work at a nature right, center. So that's right. not the thing. And so I, I was thinking that a lot of times there are these t types of festivals in other places where they, they'll combine uh, literary type events uh, with uh, an environmental setting. Mm -hmm. And they're hugely popular. And we... Our mission is to connect people with nature, and we figured that this was a great way of trying to get people outside, get people to uh, learn about the environment, read about the environment, and, and books and literature are sometimes is a great way of connecting with that environment mm -hmm. in a different, in a number of different ways. Um, I mean, not only do we have an author who we will talk about in a second or two who's going to be there, but we also will have nature journaling, how people, uh, Gilbert White is a famous nature journalist from the 19th century where he would talk about what he was seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. But there's also poetry, there's also things where people connect in different ways. Mm -hmm. And so to have that kind of festival um, really kind of opens up a lot of different things for people and we're excited about that. It seems like it's, yes, that's, before we go any further, that's, that's April 29th. Correct. Saturday mm -hmm. from 10 till 3. Yes, and it's a free event as well. Free, open to the public. Mm -hmm. So put that on your calendar. Um, but when you, you talk about nature and literature, those are two things that they sometimes they, they, they go together so well and mm -hmm. so many things because if there's so many, you know, when people read, people read for different reasons. Mm -hmm. When people in, go to nature or they seek nature for many different reasons, so mm -hmm. they kind of have that similarity in that way. Well, I mean, one of the things you can get from going to an ex you can get a lot by using books to uh, um, either it's a way of expressing yourself by writing something down mm -hmm. or it's, it's a way of learning about what you're looking at as well and sometimes that's a spiritual learning sometimes that's an educational learning mm -hmm. and they're all relevant they're all ways of making your experience in the environment a better way mm -hmm. and I mean I, I, I didn't I mean, I had to read a lot of books to, to become a zoologist, which is what my undergraduate was in. Okay. But before then, I read books about nature all the time. And I lived in a wild setting. I lived in a, quite a, a rural area. And so to me, they've always been intertwined. I go out, see a place, I want to read about it. Or I would imagine what places around the world would look like hmm. and what their environmental settings were like. So yeah. books enabled me to do that. Interesting. Um, so th with the festival, we do have a feature. We're going to have mm -hmm. many events going on. But primarily, we have a feature speaker. Correct, yes. Dennis Downs? Dennis Downs, he's going to be talking from uh, 11 o'clock to uh, noon. And he's going to be talking about trail marker trees. And trail marker trees, if people aren't familiar with them, are a, a, a Native American ways of finding your way through the landscape. And you can still find some of those in the locations. And so he's basically gone around and investigated different trail marker trees, not only just in Illinois, but in other places, parts of Canada, Colorado, the Southeast, different locations. And he's basically written a book about his experience with those trees yeah. and, 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 and what they represent. Right. We have this book and we're gonna show a slide on it so you'll, have, you'll be able to see it. But this is the book that Gareth is talking about. But in the book, um, he t I thought, well, that's interesting that it, they were all over the country, yes. well, even in Canada. Mm -hmm. So it's not just, you know, the Indians in this area, no. Native Americans in this area, mm -hmm. but all the different types of Indians, they, they use the same type of... Well, I, I think whenever you have a, a continent that's mostly trees, you need to find your way. And trail marker trees were important for either finding your way through a portage or to find where water sources were or oh. where an important village was. And what they would actually tend to do, and as the author explains, is they would actually try to initially make these markers at sort of... Um, like waist at uh, um, head height, because of what that meant is that's where Native Americans would normally look in their environments, because okay. that's normally where they're looking for prey, for game, for pointers. And so where the bend is in the tree, which they'll make sort of like, they go like this, mm -hmm. that way is where it points towards. And there's different types of trail marker trees. There are boundary markers as well that sometimes have double uh, trunks as well. Um, but it's, it's a fascinating way of finding your way. And you could, the author explains how you can verify them, whether they're actually done by an enthusiast or by a, a proper Native American tree, by how old that tree is. Mm. So if it's an older tree, then you pretty much know that it's probably from a Native American. 
most of the time. If it's something that's only 100 years old, it's probably someone going, oh, let's make some trail markets out there. So how, how old are they, some of these trees? And we're talking 150 years, okay. uh, I mean, and plus. Like, uh, is this one of his famous ones on the cover? Mm -hmm. okay. um, so this is actually kind of a marker. That he actually is also a, a sculpture. So this particular one is actually a, a sculpture of um, one that he's actually discovered and, and he's, he's actually made a bronze statue oh, out of it. That looks real. It looks cool, isn't it? It yeah. does. Yeah. yeah, he is. A, he's a sculptor, a mm -hmm. writer, uh, artist. He's mm -hmm. quite... Um, Talented. And, and it says in his uh, upbringing, he's always been involved with being outside and, and he's roamed around the woods. He, did, he went on a Voyager's canoe trip when he was much, much younger for like six weeks. And it's something that he and his brothers would do. Um, and so he's definitely had a lot of experience with the, the natural world. And he's also compiled all of that interest and, and thrown it not only with his um, artwork, but also with the um, kind of catalog in different trees around the country. Um, there's a big big chapter in here on Illinois. So there's a lot in Illinois yeah. that you can actually find. And he, he shows where they actually are as well. And so, I mean, he grew up in Illinois as, as well, but that there's the Potawatomi were the main last tribe here. Mm -hmm. And so there are a lot of trail market trees from that particular area. In our region even, yes. like Winnetka. I read there's one in Winnetka. Wilmette. Uh, oh, Wilmette, sorry. Yes. Yeah, Wilmette, sorry. Uh, but there's probably, there's probably one in Winnetka as well, if you look <laughs> for it. I'm just making that up. Um, no. But it, like he lives around the Chain of Lakes, there's some in the Chain of Lakes, mm -hmm. Starved Rock. These are all places that people are familiar with. Yeah. And sometimes I'm not sure people are sure what they're looking at. And what, he's, what he shows pretty well is you might go to a, a setting and go, what was that market trade? I'll give it a second thought. Now, once you read the book, you can go and go, oh, that's, that's a, probably a Native American trail market tree, mm -hmm. uh, just by the way it's how old it is and how it's shaped and, and, and uh, things like that. Cool. What I thought, thought was interesting in the book was that they, he shows how they're, they're made. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. how they bend this, the tree mm. and they hold it there. And he, isn't he actually going to be planting one at Lake Catherine? We, we've got a swamp white oak that we've ordered. We'll have, we got it donated by Possibility Place Nursery that Wonderful. does a lot of work for us. Uh -huh. And um, it's a swamp white oak, which is most of these trees were oaks traditionally. And we're going to be planting it. We probably won't be shaping it this year. Or he's probably not going to shape it this year. But hopefully if he comes back in years to come, he'll be able to shape it and do all that kind what of stuff. What is the time frame like on something like, I mean, because an oaks grow slowly, correct? Yeah, well, uh, oaks, once they get established, can grow quicker than you might imagine. Okay. Uh, and, and unfortunately, there's a difference between having a sapling. A sapling will grow quite quickly once it gets to a certain size, whereas a, a transplanted tree that you plant in the ground may take a while to get established oh. with its roots, then it will grow quite quickly. Okay. Um, so that establishment period may take a bit of time. but. What we need is for those roots to get established first before any modification is actually done to the actual trunk in itself. Mm -hmm. And he explains actually how to do that in here. So if it, it's almost like a spalier anyway, which, which people are familiar with, like shaping different types of trees. Uh, usually they're orchard trees. But in this case, essentially, it's Native Americans using the same techniques and him copying that um, to do it with uh, trees. Yeah. Because they and then they showed the one the one sampling that is like is it a sampling I'm not yeah. sure and they he, they pull it down mm -hmm. and then how long does it just stay like that? I think it's almost like a year or so. But what, That's I think all. It, well, it depends how long it takes for another shoot to come actually up. Okay. So depending on where a tree is actually growing, oh. it may grow slower, it may grow faster, depending on what the conditions are. Yeah, right. But as soon as you get those kind of upward, once it's bent over like this, so to speak, I'm not sure if anyone can see that, then you have these up shoots coming up from that. Mm -hmm. And those up shoots are the ones that might actually become the leader, which becomes the main trunk again. Mm -hmm. And then you prune off those other additional uh, branches that you don't actually need. So it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of a cool technique. Technique. Yeah, yeah, so, and they're they're very identifiable, right? Yes, I think once you know what you're looking for, uh, a lot of the times you may go out there and go, "Yeah, it's a crooked looking tree." Yeah, that tree looks like something happened to it. Yeah, you know? and sometimes something did. Sometimes <laughs> it was actually someone actually cultivated that, and it's actually. And once you get an eye for them, then you can really see what they actually look okay. like. Yeah. Okay. So Dennis Downs will be there for an uh, from eleven to twelve. Mm -hmm. He'll be talking about it. They'll be planting a tree. We'll go out past a tree afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You'll have, uh, we'll have, what are some other events? We have uh, creative writing. Um, so a lot of these are workshops that we'll have going on throughout the day. Um, but we'll have creative writing, we'll have um, uh, nature journaling. Um, we'll also have the hay rides, where, which you'll, you'll be on. Yes, uh, the lit literary themed hay rides. Yes. So stay tuned. That's probably going to be the best bit. Um, sure. so, <laughs> so we've got a number of different things going on today, and we've also got a number of different nature organizations coming on that right. day as well. We have well. a couple of authors, mm -hmm. local authors, and a, don't we have a photographer coming? Yes, we do. So, so there'll be some great mm -hmm. photographs. Mm -hmm. I know uh, from the one local author. 
uh, he he hiked the Appalachian Trail. He'll mm. be there with some excellent photographs. That's really exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've seen those photographs and and possibly of some poets if they show up. Because, yeah. um you know, they always get lost sometimes. <laughs> they're supposed to. And of course, in April is National uh, Poetry Month, so there's a little tie-in on mm -hmm. that. Um, and, and also, like poetry is so important. I mean, we we talk about poets and, and appreciation of the nature, but like Wordsworth is one of the most famous poets of all time. And what did he write about? He just wrote about the environment. So, like that, that's a great way for people to express themselves. Yeah, that is fun. Then. Um, so we've got, the, so for those of you who just tuned in, it's the Nature and Literature Festival coming up in April 29th at Lake Catherine mm -hmm. um, from 10 to 3, mm -hmm. okay? But, you know, we were talking about reading before we got started, mm -hmm. and I, you are, a, Gareth's a big reader, so I'm always <laughs> looking forward to new books to read. So what are some other things that, what well, have you been reading? Well, I'm not sure I'm a big reader. I'm a slow reader, but I like to read. Slow but sure. That's what counts. <laughs> so right now I'm reading a book called Common Grounds. It's by a chap called Rob Cohen. Um, and he's a British author. He was on the Wainwright uh, Prize shortlisted book series last year. And this is, he basically talks about his life as how he moves to um, uh, an outskirts of Harrogate, which is a, a, a town in Yorkshire. It doesn't sound that you know, exciting. But he gets enamored with this particular uh, area near where he lives. And he, he, he loses his job and then goes out and starts writing about this particular, what he calls an edge land. And what he calls a book is called Common Ground. An edge land is basically that, 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 that movement from urban to rural area. Hmm. and like how that, that kind of merges and how it kind of merges into people's lives as well. So he starts getting obsessed with this area. He, he maps it out. He walks there on a regular basis. What's really interesting about this book though compared to other books, and I haven't finished yet, but he actually he sa he sees a, a fox uh, on a number of different occasions. Then he unfortunately finds this fox dead one mm. day. Uh, it's got caught in barbed wire. Oh. And then he writes a story as if he's that fox go leading up to that fox's particular death. So mm. like, what did it go through? And so he almost becomes the animal in a way. Um, and so it's a really kind of, not only is it just an exploration of this particular area where it, it's that, that transfer from rural to urban. Uh, I mean, arguably this is what, what we live in right now. Um, but, but it's also that kind of like the animals and denizens that, that actually kind of live in that area and try to actually become them and learn about them. He also has a whole chapter about the hare, and this is actually kind of an appropriate time because the hare is a, uh, is a harbinger of spring. And, right. and all those kind of mythologies that are kind of tied into the hares. And the hares are actually around all year round, but you only see them kind of being active around Easter time. And Easter in itself is, is like originally like a, 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 a Greek goddess uh, of birth, um, oh, aurora, right. and all that kind of stuff. So he talks about all that and ties all that in to, to so how things. How to get that to, to be a bunny, right? Right. <laughs> uh, um, but there's the idea of, of the, like the, the hare actually being hermaphroditic because they never actually saw males and females together. They always saw their things. But the, the, that's a fallacy, but people thought that in the past. Oh, I see. And I see. because of that, that, that kind of novel freedom of birth idea, they kind of started talking talking about. I'm going off on tangents here, but, okay. um, but it's a fascinating read anyway. And he, he, so he explores this area in great depth and, and, and um, it's, it's great. I'm enjoying it a lot. Great. I, well, I can't help but thinking about the other book we were reading. Um, by the time this airs, it's going to be over. But we were reading H's for Hawk mm -hmm. by Helen MacDonald. Um, and that's a, a memoir. Mm -hmm. And we'll be talking about that at the library next week. Mm -hmm. And um, but that's her, her interaction with nature and the hawk, mm -hmm. and she's dealing with the death of her father and all mm -hmm. that. That's, those are all, I mean, again, feelings of people turning to nature when they, yeah. when they, ha when they need it, something right. for themselves. So. Which ties back into our Nature and Literature Festival really nicely. It's absolutely. And, and that's one of the reasons why I read about these kind of things and how other people experience um, their environments. They write about it and, and they write sometimes about their thoughts and feelings and ideas. And to kind of give that kind of like, that's why we want to do a festival like this and this is why we're partnering with the library with this festival, is we want to show that you can do this too. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, like when you're younger, you think about writing as being a chore, something you have to do in English class. Right. But as you get older, then you suddenly realize that this is a way of expressing oneself. And we kind of forget those ways of expressing ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing. Or even just recording. Some people don't want to express anything. And that's mm -hmm. absolutely fine too. Right. But recording what you're seeing in the environments is sometimes is a very good scientific record of what's actually going on. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's important too. Like when the first 
spring, when spring occurs, when the first leaves occur, you know, people write all this down in journals. And you know, as uh, once climate changes, you can actually see these effects over time from incidental reports as much as anything. Right. I mean, history is formed by th by things like this. Mm -hmm. Papers that that are left. Um, people find papers that people have written, not intending to become his mm -hmm. historical documents, but when you look back in history, uh, I don't know, when I was working at the archives, <laughs> there were so many papers, uh, documents, or court documents, mm. and you read about, you know, one was a, a, a court case about a woman in an apple orchard up in Michigan. Mm. She was being sued for something, but in the deposition, you read about the what happened to this orchard mm -hmm. and the climate and the, you know what effect they couldn't pay their workers because they had you know there was a drought and they had terrible so, you know something terrible a mm. freeze came or something right but this but this you could read this doc court document for two purposes one for legal purposes but also for the change of the climate and what happened in this area mm -hmm. at that certain time and it's and it's it's documented right. now. Mm -hmm. It but tells you a lot about what happened in history. Absolutely, yeah. and I, I can't help but thinking about history um, in Lake Catherine because I don't know if any, you folks realize how far back the history of of Lake Catherine, but mm -hmm. also the the club that was there before right. you. Mm -hmm. I've been dealing with um, some of the the old timers who. Mm -hmm. For those of you who don't realize what was there at Lake Catherine beforehand, it was it used to be the Palos Gun Club, mm -hmm. and this dates back to the 1930s. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the spot that uh, the actual clubhouse that is used mm -hmm. was the the Gun Club clubhouse. Yes, correct. It was built in 1969, and it was then actually in a different location. It was right. It was you turn off of Route 83. Yeah, uh, probably where that. Um, one of those business those business buildings right. are. Yeah. It was right there, and they actually had to move it after they dug the lake because they had to <laughs> dig all that stuff out. Uh -huh. I was just talking to Bob Osterberg. He's a 94 year old man. Wow. He still golfs mm. and he still shoots mm -hmm. uh, for fun. And he was telling me how the land. I mean, we have pictures. He they um, donated some photos to the library. We scanned them. They're going to be on our digital photo archive that we're starting. And the the land sloped down mm -hmm. at an eight like an eight feet slope, mm -hmm. eight foot slope, and he said they had to dig the lake out to to uh, level the land, mm -hmm. so to speak, and they had to dig out all the shot that was shot right. over all the years. Mm -hmm. But the clubhouse they moved, and he said, and if you look, if you walk past the clubhouse and you look above the doors, mm -hmm. you'll see that the little on the stone is a Palos Gun Club. It's nice to see those little legacies that you can see there. Yeah. And, and it, when, when I first uh, started working at Lake Catherine, when they told me they moved this, this thing, it's like, really? Yeah. And then I saw the photographs of it and, and documentation, like, oh yeah, I guess they did. And, yeah, and it's, they sp spent quite a bit of time doing that. It looks the same. I mean, mm -hmm. and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, the building is very, t look at a ti timeless look, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like it, to me, it was built in the 60s or 60s. Right. He said they were able to move the thing in one piece, mm -hmm. except for the fireplace. Right. So you probably knew that already. <laughs> uh, but, it, but even going further back, there's also records of, of people um, in that era before they dug the cow sag. And, and the cow sag oh, yeah. really modified that environment completely. And the reason why they dug the cow sag there, and there's records obviously of all this, uh, uh, was because they, it was a low point. And the low point was part of a glacial outpouring. Uh, and that's why it made sense. And so there's the, the documentation of why they use this area. And before that, there was actually um, some evidence of that area was used as like uh, Indian trailways as well. So it kind of all ties back in. No kidding. Wow, we come back back to trails and trail marker trees. And Gareth, I appreciate you being here today. He's a busy guy, especially in April and springtime, but you know, we'd love to have you on the show. The the Nature and Literature Festival coming up. Mark your calendars, folks, because it's the first of its kind, you're, and you're going to want to be there. It's April 29th, Saturday, mm -hmm. from good. 10 to 3. And um, so thank you for being with us today. Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, come back next month when we talk about the new things in May.